Welcome to the Scripted Podcast. I am your host, Kevin O'Connor, Marketing Director here at Scripted. And I am John Parr, the Writer Community Manager. It's It's been a little bit uh, since our last episode, Kevin. Uh, I think uh, Kevin actually has some good news to share as to why that is. Yeah, that's my fault. I apologize. I had, <laughs> uh, I had a human baby. Um, it's, yep. Human Confirmed. son. Confirmed. <laughs> Was born on August 29th, so this kind of set back things uh, a bit. But. Yeah. Yeah. What it, what an inconvenience yeah. that child is, right? For the podcast listeners. I'm mostly awake right now, um, but <laughs> we are back. I bet. And, uh, and also exciting, besides the uh, newest addition to the scripted family, is we also have uh, a pretty exciting guest today. Uh, we have uh, Mikhail Pitsonic. And uh, Kevin, tell me a little bit about our, our guest that we're going to have on. Uh, Mikhail Patsonic is a marketer for Ahrefs, um, one of our favorite tools and leaders in the industry. And he's written some really great stuff on the subject of semantic search. So we wanted to bring him in to tell us more about semantic search, why it's so important to understand for businesses and for content writers. That's right. And uh, with that, let's get into it. All right. Today is Mikhail Petsonic, a content writer and marketer at Ahrefs. Mikhail, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, absolutely. So our topic today is uh, semantic search, something Mikhail has written about pretty extensively at Ahrefs. Let's start by asking you simply, what is semantic search? Why is it important? Why should we care? Uh, okay, so maybe before I say any, any explanations, any descriptions of semantic search, uh, I want to say an example of that. Sure. So sure. Uh, are you guys familiar with Star Wars? We are. <laughs> of course, yes. Okay, okay. So let's say that you're seeing this one of the Star Wars movies for the first time, and yeah. uh, you really like Chewbacca, but you don't really know who, who Chewbacca is, like what is, what is his name? So right. let's say that you want to Google uh, the name of the character Chewbacca. Uh, what, would you, what would you put into Google? What would you Google? Uh, big, big hairy guy, uh, Star Wars. Yeah, Dogman Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Star Wars? yeah. Uh, yeah, that's. I think this this is a pretty good example of what the uh, semantic search is, or why it is really important. Because I actually tried this yesterday. I was I was wondering, and this was also my first idea. Like, who's the hairy guy in Star Wars? Star Wars hairy guy with a crossbow. Star Wars bear with a crossbow. Yeah. Or if you're right. a little bit familiar with with the Star Wars universe, you can also ask Google who's Han Solo's co-pilot yeah. or who's Han Solo's sidekick. Right. And basically, you're looking for the same answer, right? So I used all of these search queries in Google yesterday, and Google correctly said that it's, it's Chewbacca. And I think like five out of six times, it actually gave me the knowledge card. It's, it was like 100% sure that it's Chewbacca. It said Chewbacca right, right away without like giving me uh, the plain blue link. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. basically, this is what's semantic search is about and why it's so important. So just to, uh, just to say it in words, it's basically an information retrieval process that returns the most relevant results um, based on the actual meaning of the search query. So you didn't really mention Chewbacca in our, in our search queries, but Google understood what it's about and it returned the best uh, search results for that. Right, and I don't think yeah. a lot of people think about what goes into that and how difficult that was for Google to achieve. So my question for you is, I mean, how did they get there, right? What, what, <laughs> yeah. what are the big things that they did? And you mentioned the knowledge graph, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I can start with the knowledge graph. That's basically the kind of the beginning 
of how Google got started with semantic search or how it got started with semantic search when it was really working. But I think it's uh, it can be useful to actually mention things before that, before what happened on the on the internet, on the web, before even we had semantic search, because that's what actually allowed we had we, we had to have some development of the World Wide Web to have the technologies available to enable semantic search, right? So right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if we're going really back to the history, uh, basically we identify resources on the World Wide Web by the URLs. Those are uh, uniform resource locators. And the word uniform is really important here because it's basically, it's a standard of communication that the machines on the internet basically understand between each other. The problem with this was uh, how we got to semantic search uh, was that basically we only got the URLs and the links between them, right? Mm -hmm. That's how Google actually um, was invented. Uh, That's how it could have worked even before semantic search. But the problem was that the only meaning that they were able to extract from those pages or how they were related was only through links. So that was used as an indicator of kind of like related content. And as we all know, Google or any search engine back in the days, uh, it was really susceptible to kind of black SEO or not really good SEO uh, techniques, Mm -hmm. uh, how you can manipulate uh, the rankings, but it's really good now. So this uh, this connection to links is how Google PageRank was born, basically estimating value of a page based on the quality and quantity of pages that link to it. And then Google also had other stuff like meta keywords, which are really outdated these days. But for example, Chinese uh, search engine Baidu, they still use it. And hmm. then you have the standard stuff like title tags, meta descriptions, and Google uh, anchor text and links and exact keyword matches, which Google used before. And that was like pretty simple stuff, let's say, compared to what we have now. But uh, as I already mentioned, and as we all know, uh, that's, that was really easily uh, manipulable. Mm-hmm. And Google wasn't really returning the best search results before, uh, before we had a semantic search. So. First, we had to have something like a semantic web, right? Because there's no semantic search uh, without a semantic web. The funny thing is that the proposition or the idea of semantic web uh, was proposed by the same guy, Sir uh, Bernalski, who invented the World Wide Web. And (laughs) uh, he actually, he actually proposed a system a web where information is organized according to certain norms and rules. He called this linked data. We'll come back to this later. And mm-hmm. it should be used for easier processing and information retrieval. And here is where we're getting to the semantic search. Because in 2011, uh, that's when schema.org came to life. Uh, it's basically a project that promotes using structured data uh, on the web. And it's, it's a common project of uh, the big corporations like Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo. And the most common language uh, used for structured data these days is JSON-LD, which is JavaScript object notation for linked data. So this, is, this really goes back to the history of, of the linked data. And here we have the semantic search. And I think we can now talk really about the technologies. <laughs> right. Yeah. So like, as you said, the system used to be gamed a lot with keyword stuffing and black hat SEO, as you said. So Google needed to evolve. And now that kind of brings us to semantic search was the evolution they, they put together to put that gaming to rest almost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the first big step in semantic search to get there was the knowledge graph, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly it. And it was in 2012, mm-hmm. like the year after schema.org was born. And basically knowledge graph is a knowledge base of interconnected entities, which 
may need some further clarification. So entities are basically objects or concepts that can be distinctly identified. And uh, we can imagine those most commonly as things, companies, places, or those can be even intangible stuff like colors or feelings. And the knowledge graph basically uh, extracts all these things to its database to, let's say, index of the entities and creates uh, relationships between them, how they are related to each other. And they really have a lot of this stuff uh, in their database, uh, I think. They posted like a few months ago and they, they released a blog post and I think it was like 5 trillion entities, something like that. Wow. That's a lot of entities. That's a lot of people, places and things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and the, the, the thing is why, why this is so important for Google or for the evolution of search or how the search works, how SEO works, is that the entities are actually uh, language agnostic. Uh, so once you have the entity in the knowledge graph, you know the relationship with our entities and you don't really need to care about the specifics of each language. So they can, let's say, that they have the connections from English, mm -hmm. but someone in a less used language, let's say, hmm, let's say Portuguese, mm. uh, where the Google algor algorithm might not be working that well as in English. And they can basically use the connections that they gathered from the English data to return better search results for uh, Portuguese Google. Wow. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm currently studying Japanese and I encounter this quite a bit when searching in Japanese, uh -huh. that there's some similarities that I can see to some of the results, depending on what you're searching on. Is it, is it different across all languages or um, are some are a little more centralized to the results that you're getting in English? Uh, I'm not sure. I, ne I never tested this, mm. but... Uh, what I can say by, by using Google in quite a lot of languages, um, most of the time I use it in English, but I also, I'm Czech, so I use the Czech language and sure. I sometimes use uh, Spanish and I know Chinese. So I did a fair bit of searching in, in these languages as well. And yeah, sure. English probably works the best, but I think Google is really getting there where they don't really need to kind of like polish their algorithms for each and every language. And they can use like the unified entity system to kind of like adjust, uh, adjust the quality of, of the search results. For right. Kids. And always with Google, it's almost like where they want to be is what they promote uh, rather than where they are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, when they talk about like eat, they've been trying to get to that with quality content um, for a long time. And that's what they've recommended as uh, a guideline for content. But are they 100% there yet? Are they serving up like eat quality content every time? Probably not, but they're working on it. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're seeing the progress basically all the time. I mean, after after the knowledge graph, it was 2012, so it's mm -hmm. eight years ago. And since then, we had much more technologies, important technologies regarding the semantic search yeah. uh, that Google came up with. So the year later, in 2013, they came up with Hummingbird, which I think was probably one of the biggest uh, algorithmic changes right. of all time for Google. That was that hit the SEO world pretty hard. Um, yeah, yeah. Bird was is still very, very talked about in algorithm updates. And for people who might not know, why don't, we, why don't you explain what kind of impact that had exactly? Uh, so basically, Hummingbird, Hummingbird tried to solve the problem from kind of uh, retrieving the search results based on keyword matches uh, to the actual meaning of the search results. So it really went to the semantic search direction. It's basically a shift from keywords to context and the actual meaning of the search query. So if you, prior to Hummingbird, if you were using all the kind of like weaknesses of Google and creating, let's say, um, 10 different pages, on basically the same topic, but targeting 
a bit different keywords that that can be covered in the one topic, then it was possible that you were ranking for all of those 10 pages before Hummingbird. But after Hummingbird, Google kind of figured out that it's just one topic and that none of those 10 pages really satisfy the search intent and they're kind of like duplicates of each other. So instead, what, what you had to do after that was to kind of uh, put all the content together and to focus on topics instead of single keywords. Right. So, uh, John, the what, what used to happen before Hummingbird is you would, on your website, you would have a bunch of different pages of content that are basically around the same topic, but you would just substitute a similar word for it, right? Right. So it would be, say you're trying to sell sneakers, and you would have a, a page for black sneakers, but then you'd have another page for black running shoes, and then you'd have another page for black Nike running shoes. Like, and then that, like uh, Mikhail said, you would end up ranking for all those terms on all those different pages. But when Hummingbird came along, that update helped Google understand that these were all the same and that one single page should really encompass all of these terms. Isn't that right, Mark? Thanks for making it more clear than me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give an example for John. John's uh, not like in the SEO world so much. Um, Okay, and okay. he kind of represents a, a majority of our writing uh, audience. I see. So being able to lay it out for them, for people who aren't in this every day for the last however many years. <laughs> no, and I remember that era as well. I remember the web uh, pre-Hummingbird in this sense, where there was a lot of junk like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, so that was a great, huge step in the in the step toward more higher quality content and better search results, right? Yeah, definitely. But that wasn't uh, nearly the, the end of it. Mm -hmm. And Google, Google really progressed since Hummingbirds as well. So what came after that was RankBrain, which uh, I think the best description of it would be no one really knows what it does exactly, <laughs> but it's one of the strongest ranking signals. <laughs> yeah. It almost it sounds like an evil, like like a villain in a Marvel comic. Rank <laughs> brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds really bad. So my, my my take on rank brain is that it's kind of it's it's not a standalone uh, algorithmic update. It's more of a update of the humming hummingbird itself. Mm -hmm. It focuses more on searchers' true intent and kind of adjusts the importance of ranking signals based on the search query. So let's say that you may be looking for, for Chewbacca and in this kind of sense, maybe it's preferring pages that have the most links from Star Wars related websites. Mm -hmm. But if you're searching for something regarding a disease that you may have, then it may, mm, it may put more importance on on the author of of the article or on the domain where the where uh, the information is. So it's kind of like dynamically adjusting ranking signals based on each and every query uh, via their machine learning stuff, which is super complex and I don't know anything about it, so I wouldn't delve into that. But yeah, that's 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 my take on it. So you mentioned structured data. What's that? And why is it important for business owners to understand structured data? Okay, so I think a lot of people uh, actually associate structured data with the schema markup, but it's not the same thing. It's it's not a synonym. Uh, the schema markup is actually uh, a part of structured data, and it's the most prominent part in the SEO world in the in the World Wide Web. But you have you have other kinds of structured data. So you have databases where you have like stored information in a certain format that Google or other machines can really understand and read. So I didn't really say what structured data is in the first place. So it's basically uh, a type of data that's easily readable for machines that they can understand what it basically is. So you're making it easier for machines to understand your content by providing the structured data. And you have you have databases like Wikidata, 
which are basically just um, big tables of data, let's say name company like like Ahrefs, country Singapore, uh, founder Dmitry Gerasimenko, and so on. So Google can understand it from this. Then you have like company profiles on big prominent websites, let's say like Crunchbase, or you have websites that are focusing on uh, companies on the market like Yahoo Finances and Bloomberg, like these company profiles, those are also kind of structured the same way. So it's really easy to extract the entities from that to understand more about the entities or companies in this, uh, in this instance. Then you have social media profiles where you also, it's also kind of structured in the same way. So these are databases. Then you have HTML5, which is not as important as the other stuff, but you can also make it easier for machines to understand your content or how it is placed on your, on your page by using HTML5. So the difference between using this and the previous versions is that let's say for a blog of content, you would use a tag like a div or span in HTML before HTML5. Mm -hmm. But with HTML5, instead of using div or span, mm -hmm. Uh, which doesn't say anything about where what the content is about or where it is on the page. You can actually uh, use tags like article or navigation or footer. So you're making it easier for the machines to understand like where the content, where the parts, what what's actually the role of of this on the page, right? Right. So is that why we as SEOs recommend for content writers and website owners that their data is structured, their structured data is basically the same reason why we ask them to put subtitles and headings like H1s and H2s in their content to make it easier for machines to understand what the. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, I think you can, you can use this explanation as well. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Then as, as we talk about, you have the, you have the schema markup, which is really now a pretty big database of, of like uh, data types and their properties that you can tag your content with. So mo it's mostly used for uh, rich snip uh, for those rich snippets. So let's say you have a product page, you have an e-commerce store, and you have a lot of products. You can kind of mark up the reviews, so it kind of like aggregates the overall uh, overall review of the of the product. So you see right in the SERP that a certain product has four stars out of five. You can you can mark up its price, so it can also appear in the SERP, and you have. A lot of types of these rich snippets, mm -hmm. but you also have a lot of our schema markups that can't be really used for that can be really shown in the SERP, but you can use it for machines for Google to better understand your content and kind of increase the chance of getting into the knowledge graph. Because as we already talked kind of a bit about the evolution of, of the search, where it's going. Uh, I think Google is on the way of kind of shifting its, its focus from the link graph uh, to the knowledge graph. So it's kind of like, it's, I don't know, maybe it's doing right now, maybe it's testing it. I don't know, the progress of it, just a speculation right. that it's, it's when we talk about the languages uh, of how it can be adjusting its algorithm based on languages, how it knows. Uh, what's going on in every language. It's easier for them to retrieve the information from the entities, from, from the knowledge graph, right? So I think it's gonna be pretty important to be to be part of the knowledge graph. It's even important now, but it's gonna be more important in the future to, to own an entity in, in the knowledge graph. So, you know, from a practical standpoint here, when you're reading this content on the web, um, how do you personally know when a writer uh, has good on-page SEO knowledge? What are what are the factors that make that up within the content itself? Uh, I probably take a bunch of their URLs of content that they've written, and if it's written for organic traffic purposes, I would probably expect that it's ranking well. Right. So if it's not ranking well, it's a pretty good signal <laughs> that something's wrong. But it not may be the problem or the, it may not be caused by the writer uh, themselves. Right. And so, I'm sorry, what, what factors exactly um, 
would fall onto the writer. For example, like <clears throat> in an instance where it is the writer's fault that these aren't ranking. So once we once we know that it's really the writer's fault, so we kind of like scratch off the technical factors uh, of the of the website, the links uh, pointing to that page, and we're really left with the content then it's most likely about not satisfying the search intent. And the easiest thing that the writer can do is taking the topic, the main keyword, uh, plugging it in into Google and click through the top results and see if the angle or if the content that they wrote about, if it's if, if the angle or if it's similar to the top ranking results. If it's not, then they need to kind of like refresh the content. Right. Got it. I think we recommend that to our writers as well. Um, we do. We yeah. always look at the top search results and see what's missing in the content, if there's ideas missing, but also it, what is common in all of those results. If there's topics that they cover in all of them, it should be included in yours as well if you're trying to rank for that topic, right? Yeah, it's 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 not all though. Like, uh, I think most people wouldn't get far if you just looked at the top ranking pages for a certain topic and kind of distilled the knowledge of those 10 pages into a new article. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't really bring any additional value, right? Yeah. That's, just, that's just like writing an article based on 10 other articles. So I would prioritize content based on what additional value you can provide or new angles, something like that. So, well, I guess where, where I would go next is, you know, on this content, like, let's say that we're trying to produce quality content here. Um, would you say that these focus keywords and topics are in the title, the first paragraph, in title tags, is it throughout the piece as a whole? It's a difficult question to answer, definitely. I would say uh, the SEO favorite, it depends. <laughs> right. <laughs> because uh, first of all, you gotta make sure that the angle of the con that you know the reader of the content. So for example, uh, based on our experience or based on our SEO content and Ahrefs, uh, I can basically write a really advanced uh, uh, link building article for like link building tips article, uh, but it will be about like using automation stuff like APIs and all of this like advanced stuff. So it it might be better. It might provide more value than your your default link building tips article, but it's not for the reader. It's not for for the searcher of link building tips. Right. The person looking for link building, link building tips is most likely a beginner and they're definitely not looking for some advanced techniques. So you need to know the writer, you need to know what they want to see. Right, yeah. So it's not enough, like you said, to just recreate what's already out there. It, yeah. It's more about understanding. Your question should always be, what does the what is the searcher's intent? And what, what is it they're trying to learn and how much can I answer in this one piece of content, right? Rather than this is where your keywords go, this is how many times you have to put your keywords in there. That's kind of antiquated at this point, especially with semantic search, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I definitely would still put the main keyword or the topic right. into the title tag, right? Because this basically summarizes uh, the page. So it kind of belongs there. So it's important. It's also be also belongs to the meta descriptions that shows up uh, in the SERP. And like the headings, the H1, H2, it should be structured so it makes sense for the reader. So it's it's probably going to contain mm -hmm. uh, keywords that are most relevant to the topic that should be talked about, right? So it's kind of like natural to include those. So I wouldn't obsess over that if you, if you don't include a certain keyword, but it often comes naturally. Yeah, and I think as our, our previous guest, uh, John Tyreman, who does research in uh, D.C. for a marketing agency, he had mentioned basically for content writers, all this means is following the rules of like journalism, of good writing, the who, what, mm -hmm. where's and why's, and just basically trying to answer all those questions in your content. And, right. and then taking those next steps, those deeper steps 
And the research and looking at the SERP results help you with anything you may be missing in your content. Like, oh, I forgot to answer that question. Or this question here that they answer in all these results is also inadequate. Maybe I can add to it. Yeah, and it's not always uh, about the words or about the content itself. Another example from like the HF story before I joined, uh, we had a page about backlink checker. So the main keyword or the topic was backlink checker. People wanting wanting to know to check their backlinks, and the problem was that it was just a product page about our backlink checker, but it actually didn't have the backlink checker on it, so it never really ranked that high. Mm-hmm. But uh, once once we added the actual backlink checker, the tool to it, it's it's number one since then, I think. Right. So you gave them what they want that wasn't exactly yeah. content, but you gave them what they were looking for, which is the actual checker, right? So Google probably saw those certain signals, like the time they spent on the page, your bounce rate, stuff like that, and gave you a boost. We don't know what exactly like triggered that. Right. It could be like... All, all, all these kind of like signals, like the bounce rate, uh, time on the page, dwell time. Uh, I wouldn't obsess over that. It's never been like confirmed, like a ranking, ranking signal or something, mm-hmm. but it's definitely satisfying uh, the user intent and contributing to a better user experience on the page. For sure. Uh, yeah. And that's the goal, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, you know, out of curiosity, what what is the most common SEO myth that you think is out there today? <laughs> I know that's uh, probably a long <laughs> list. I think it's it's not like a myth, but it's probably just like obsessing over each and every piece that can contribute to how the results are ranked. Mm-hmm. So how we talk like right now about like time on page, bounce rate, dwell right. time, links, content, keywords, whatever, everything adds on the page. Uh, if it's mobile optimized, how it's loaded and all of these things, crawlability, whatever, uh, people often take it out of the context. Like it never really depends on just one thing and you should in general just strive to provide the best user experience and satisfy search intent, which is kind of like goes a lot beyond SEO. It's a lot of user experience, convert, conventional rate optimization, uh, yeah. PR, branding, and all of this stuff. It's all interconnected, intertwined, right? Right. So beyond even all of these these different factors that are there, it kind of just drills back down to quality content then. Uh, quality content, links, and Basically, other marketing activities that are getting you the links, are getting you the publicity, are getting the stuff, are getting your content to people. I think it's it's not really an SEO thing per se, but mm. I think most content writers actually spend too much time on writing the actual content and not much time on actually promoting the content. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um John, do you have anything else on the writer's end? Yeah. So uh, what would you recommend for writers to better understand the concept of search intent? Like if a writer is just starting out here, you know, Mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend, say, maybe as a resource or what they could do today to, you know, improve their own understanding, but also to improve the quality of their content in context of, of that? Uh, yeah, sure. So the easiest way, as I already mentioned, is just plugging in a certain keyword, a certain topic into into Google and going through the results. But that way, you don't really know what you're up against. I mean, you can write a really good piece of content better than anything in the top 10 search results. But because all of those other 10 pages on, on the first SERP that they have a lot of links, and they're kind of like established websites and there are tons of other factors in play. Even though you may have the best content, it may take ages or you may not, you may never get there with the best content. So you have to look at right. other stuff too. That's why we have Ahrefs, right? <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so, so, so basically instead, inst- that's what we do every time 
before we start writing a new content, before I or anyone uh, anyone else from the content team, before we start outlining any content, we always check how difficult it would be to rank for a certain topic. And it's based on, on a metric, on our proprietary metric that's called keyword difficulty. And that takes mm. into account uh, links pointing to the pages on the first server on in the server basically. So so it tells you how difficult it would be to rank for a certain keyword. And it's it's log- on, on a logarithmic scale. So let's say keyword difficulty uh, zero to thirty, it's pretty easy for most websites. And then it goes up kind of really quickly. So let's say there's a huge difference. There's not much difference between the keyword difficulty five and keyword difficulty 25, but there's a huge difference uh-huh. between keyword difficulty uh, 70 and 75 in terms mm-hmm. of the number of links that are pointing to the pages that are already ranking for that keyword. Right. And- yeah, no, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, no, I was just, uh, we didn't really get into your background or what you're doing over there at HS oh. before we got into all <laughs> So I wanted to ask you really uh, how you ended up at Ahrefs and what you got going on over there. We love it. Uh, we love your tools. I mean, for my money, it's the best SEO tool. Uh, I, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I was actually an avid Ahrefs user before I joined the team. I think it's actually expected from anyone in the marketing team. I don't think anyone using Monsters SEM Rush would just go to apply to Ahrefs, so you got to be kind of a fun boy. <laughs> so, so before I joined Ahrefs, uh, I was working as a head of marketing for another software as a service company. And yeah, so I just joined another an, another software as a service company and this time in, in the SEO space that I'm most interested about. So yeah, you applied there and now you work out of, like, is there a... Headquarters that you're at? Oh, or yeah. You, you uh, so we have uh, headquarters in Singapore, but uh, we have the team all over the world. I think it's like 50-50, maybe 50% of the team is working from in Singapore and they are working from home these days, right? <laughs> anyway, <Yes>. and <laughs> like 50% of the team is, is scattered throughout the world. We have, I think we have people on every continent probably yeah we are, we're, we're we're really global even wow. though we're a small team we have people everywhere yeah can you tell us about any uh, upcoming projects that you guys got going on they're excited about so i think i can disclose two things because by the time this episode is published we'll already have those two new tools or functionality released the first one is really big actually it's a free version of hrefs uh, it's called Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. You'll be able to find it at ahrefs.com slash awt. And uh, it's basically for any website owner and they will be able to uh, see all the SEO issues they can have with their websites through our site audit. So the first thing we add there is the complete site audit functionality. And the second thing they'll have access to with uh, HWT is our site explorer, where they can see their backlinks and keyword data, which is pretty cool considering that it's gonna be free. And the second functionality is actually within the site audit tool and it's for internal linking. Uh, Basically, you'll be able to find internal linking opportunities really quickly and easily. It will basically tell you on which page you might be missing internal links to other pages, so you'll be able to better pass your internal page rank. So these are two pretty cool things that we have going on right now. Awesome. And so we're going to segue into a different segment here in a moment, but um, before we do, I noticed that uh, you are a fan of fragrance. So before we do, I wanted to ask you uh, your top fragrance recommendation in addition oh, to your other wow. expertise. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a fragrance collector these days. I, I have like 
probably like 50 fragrances, like bottles and hundreds of, of wow. samples. So it's really hard to, to say my favorite fragrance of all of those. Uh, it really depends on the situation. But these days in the summers, uh, I'm a huge fan of Asia. I've been living in, in Asia. I love green tea. So one of my most favorite mm. fragrances these days is based on green tea. And it's from a company in Nishana and it's called Wulong Cha. So oh, wow. it's a green green tea based fragrance. <laughs> I don't think I, I'm a bit I, of I, a... I, I don't think a, a lot of people know about it because uh, you it's not in the like the Macy's, Sephora, and this kind of shops, you know. Yeah, no, no, no. I I, I got into that world a little oh, bit okay. myself nice. a few years ago, <laughs> and and uh, I, I I keep it basic with uh, mostly Creed. Oh, 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 nice. Uh, what's what's what's, yeah. what's your favorite Aventus, Creed? Is it, uh, is it Aventus or something else? Aventus, of course, and and maybe a little uh, Green oh, Irish perfect, Tweed perfect. from time to time. Nice. <laughs> I gotta say, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. But I really enjoy it. The roles have reversed now. <laughs> it's uh, so for this next segment, we've got a segment called "Solve My Problem," and basically the way it works is we present an issue to you, and you tell us uh, what you think that the best solution for this particular problem uh, would be. All right, let's go. Let's do it. So I own a boutique retail clothing store. I have a nice e-commerce site set up and I want to compete in organic search, but I don't know where to start. Is it possible for me to compete with these chain stores in organic? And what should I be doing to gain visibility? Uh, yes. So uh, is it starting? Is it like brand new website? No, let's say we're established a uh, five-year-old okay, site. Okay. But you're not, you're not really successful in organic yet, right? No, uh, okay. all I've done is Google ads okay, and okay. Facebook ads. So I would probably line up low hanging fruit opportunities for, for the content, you know, so uh, basically uh, topics that don't have high keyword difficulty, but can generate a significant amount of traffic. So we can target that because I, we can probably expect that that's such a website doesn't really have a strong backlink portfolio. So next to this, in addition to kind of having a content plan uh, based on the long hanging fruit opportunities, I would also think about creating content that actually uh, can acquire the links because uh, let's be honest, like no one's gonna link to your product pages most of the time uh, besides mm -hmm. affiliates, right? And that really doesn't count. So you need some some pages that will attract links. So kind of like brainstorm ideas of these pages don't really need to rank in organic. They need to attract links. And from those pages, you can kind of pass the page rank to other pages that you care about. So you can create some, you can come up with some infographics. You can come up with some survey, data study, uh, your own data representation, some new angle, something that can get the needle moving. So, yeah. So right. maybe something that will spark a debate. Yeah, yeah. So 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 these would be the two things that I would focus on content wise. But besides content, you have all the other technical stuff, right? If if your if your website is not isn't really crawlable or you have like indexing issues, then you gotta take care of that first, right? Mm -hmm. and sign up for google my business uh yeah for for this for this kind of uh kind of business that that should actually help and i don't know how much impact it, it has on the knowledge graph but once you're in google my business uh, you kind of have the knowledge panel yourself i don't know if i should call it knowledge panel because it's a bit different but every time you look up like pizza or sushi or barbershop or something like that uh you get the, this uh, knowledge panel from Google My Business, right? And and you you see it on the map, so you can get included in there, and it may increase the chance of getting you into the knowledge graph on and getting the uh, entities from from your web pages extracted because Google My Business is actually another database of structured data. You write your info in there. 
All right. Which brings us back to structured data and how important that is yeah. for every business. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm not sure if I point, pointed this out, but structured data is pretty cool topic, but I wouldn't prioritize that unless you have other SEO tasks already done, like the important ones. So let's say the content links, uh, the technical aspect, the technical health of the website, um, mm -hmm. even even like the UX, like structured data is cool, but it's it should never be the priority. Most of the websites have more important things to do than structured data. Right, it's a kind of an advanced yeah, yeah. strategy, for sure. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This is just amazing. You are, you know, a wealth of information. I really enjoyed the chat. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, of course. Do you have any uh, shout outs, any promotions you want to plug for us? Uh, sure. So I actually wrote quite a few articles on this and relevant topics that you can find on the Ahrefs blog. So if you write Ahrefs, semantic search, knowledge graph, featured snippets, uh, I wrote articles about it, and basically we're publishing articles most of the time, two times a week, and I'm really a fan of that. I, I've always been a fan of our content, and I would also recommend people uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Ahrefs YouTube channel, because uh, Sam, uh, our content creator on YouTube, uh, he has hands down, and I know I'm biased here, but he has hands down the best SEO videos on YouTube. So if you want to delve into into SEO, that's that's the way to go. And it, most of the time, it's it's pretty beginner friendly. Most of the topics uh, are also suitable for beginners. Yes, I, I can't recommend the Ahrefs blog enough for beginners or veterans to to really take in complicated subjects and have them laid out in the in the simplest and easy to read format. You guys do a lot of great work over there. I'm a huge fan. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Mikal. Yeah. Thank you guys. So that was quite in depth. There's a lot to kind of take uh, from that there. Um, I have a bunch of questions, Kevin, and you know, uh, pertaining to what we just discussed there. But before I do, is there any kind of take home points that you'd like to, to discuss? Well, I mean, Mikhail is a very experienced and proficient marketer, and he was able to break down some pretty complicated things for us. Um, yeah. Basically, what Google does and how it's gotten to where it's gotten is is technical and he he explained that pretty great um and i understand that for a lot of our audience that may be a little too technical but for if you're a content writer or you're a business owner i think it's very valuable to understand how google works and the steps it took to get here and what that means for your content and how can you really write for this these advanced algorithms Right. It's, uh, you know, my takeaway, despite the technicality of what we had there, um, is that, that it is possible to explain it in a, in a simpler way. Um, I think part of the problem with, with these topics in particular is that they can seem kind of unapproachable. Um, but the things that pertain to, say, you know, uh, marketers or that pertain to writers who are creating content um, can be grasped. So, you know, one question I have for you too, you know, on the marketing side here is that, um, is that something that you think is reflected in the industry as a whole that, you know, this, this, this monster has just kind of grown out of control and complexity? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of black box to it, um, for yeah. sure that we just don't know, or that Google will just won't tell you, um, right. Right. But there's best practices that work and there's data behind those practices that show that it works. And I right. think to a lot of what Mikal said was, is that don't get obsessed with these rules, but write to your user intent. And I think right. that's a good lesson. 
Like you want to understand that there are rules, that there's technical rules behind why certain content ranks. But at the end of the day, you should write for the searcher and what they're searching for and to do your best to answer those queries. And that's right. how you end up really giving yourself the best chance. There's obviously there's link building and other thing and authority of your site that go into to ranking and ranking quickly, but uh, as quickly as you can. But really when you're a content writer, it's doing what you were taught in whatever uh, school of writing that you <laughs> went through. And it's the, right. you know, who, what, where, and why, and answer to the fullest extent with, with good data behind it. And uh, right. I think that's a, it's a good lesson for any content writer in any business. And so, uh, are there any resources that uh, may be available for any kind of writers who are trying to grasp a little of what we just discussed um, with Mikhail? Yeah, Mikhail does a great job of writing about it on the Ahrefs blog, and um, we'll include those links in the uh, blog post for this episode, for sure. And right. uh, since we spoke to him and he couldn't really tell us about it before, um, Ahrefs actually launched a couple of new free tools that are great for content marketers. There's the um, Ahrefs webmaster tools and the, uh, their new in, in, internal linking tool as well. Um, so we'll, we'll add links to those and, and, and let you guys see those because we think what they're doing right now is great. And if it's free, then it, even, even better. Yeah. We'll get those out into the, uh, to the writer community newsletter as well. Um, and get them into the hands of some of the writers here at scripted. Uh, that's about all I have on this topic. How about you, Kevin? Yeah, I think we covered it. And, uh, you know, I really want to thank Mikhail again for, uh, for joining us today and, uh, yeah. and, and breaking down some pretty complicated stuff. All right, then. Well, until next episode, this was the scripted podcast.